Hello, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we're going to look at Unit 16.1, Regicide to Republic. We will look at King James I, his son, King Charles I, and we will look at the English Civil War. Let us travel to Northwestern Europe, to the British Isles, to the British Isles, where... Just like in mainland continental Europe, war will soon come. War will soon come uh, in this century, the 17th century, the 1600s, this time of so much war, revolution, and reformation. James I. James the first. He was the first of the Stuart kings. By the way, the Stuart dynasty will take over from the Tudor dynasty in England and rule over Britain until 1714. And it will be the Stuarts uh, who see Britain transform itself from a far flung kingdom to a major player within the European and world stage. Background on James. Well, James was the only son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and her second husband, Henry Stuart, or Lord Darnley, as he was known. Mary, Queen of Scots, has fled France. She is now in Scotland, a devout Catholic, although Scotland um, is rapidly becoming Calvinist, part of the Reformation. It is torn between Calvinism and Catholicism. Both Mary, Queen of Scots, and James' father, Lord Donnelly, Darnley, pardon me, um, are the uh, great grandchildren. Are the great grandchildren of Henry the Seventh of England, and so um, this is how James will have a claim on the English throne, and and this is how he is related to uh, Elizabeth Tudor. Anyways, Henry Stuart or Lord Darnley was murdered. He was murdered. Mary, Queen of Scots' husband and James I's father was murdered, most likely by her or who will become her third husband, the fourth Earl of Bothwell, James Hepburn. He most likely killed Mary, Queen of Scots' second husband, James' father. In the end, in the end, Mary, Queen of Scots is arrested by Protestant Scottish nobles and placed on house arrest. With her in prison, her infant son, he's aged 13 months uh, when he is made King of Scotland. Uh, he becomes King James VI of Scotland and rules with regents uh, 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 in, uh, in, in, in his mother's place. She is in prison. I mentioned this earlier, uh, very quickly, uh, she becomes Mary Queen of Scots, James's mother becomes involved in a plot to have Mary, uh, I mean, uh, Elizabeth um, killed with Mary Queen of Scots, who also has a claim on the throne through her great grandfather, Henry VII, uh, she would be placed on the crown as a Catholic. Elizabeth learns of this conspiracy. Um, she's told by her advisors, you have to order the death of Mary, Queen of Scots. And she says, no, no, no. Finally, she says, yes. Her advisors knew that Elizabeth changed her mind a lot. So as soon as she agreed to have Mary, Queen of Scots put to death, uh, they do it. And they were right, because shortly thereafter, the next morning, Elizabeth goes, you know what? Forget it. I didn't mean that. I don't want her killed. I can't. She's family. Um, but they had already killed her. They had already uh, uh, beheaded Mary, Queen of Scots. And so now James, as an infant, or as a young child, um, is without a mother, but he is the King of Scotland. Why is this important? Well, Elizabeth I had no children, had no heir, never married, the Virgin Queen. And so when she dies, and she knows uh, that she'll die, right? We all do. Um, she knows that James Stewart, her cousin, uh, will become King James the First of England, and here he is, James the Sixth of Scotland, but James the First of England. This is the unification of the Tudor Rose 
and the Scottish thistle. This is the unification of the crown of Scotland and England, hence the United Kingdom. Up until this point, the Scots were very much independent, as much as England tried to stop this. Um, Ireland was uh, owned by England by the 1400s, for the most part, not completely, for the most part. Um, but in 1603, with the uh, coronation of James I, Scotland and England and Ireland, for that matter, are united. And this is when we see the Union flag the Union flag that many of us recognize today. Uh, this was the original Union flag here, 1606. It will not uh, include Ireland until 1801. The St. Andrew's cross is this one up here. This is St. Patrick's cross, um, but this is the original Union flag. And so uh, I may from now on begin to speak of British uh, soldiers rather than simply English or Scottish soldiers. Um, this was not always the way that uh, it was envisioned that the flag would be. There were many Scots who wanted to see their St. Andrew's Cross over St. George's Cross of England. Uh, so had things been a little bit different, had Scotland been more powerful at this time and England less powerful, this might have been the Grand Union flag. Nevertheless, let us get to the reign of James Stewart. He is now the King of England and the King of Scotland. Overall. Overall, James's reign over England and Scotland was quite good. He uh, will not see he will not see any great religious wars like what is happening in France and the German states. Although he does have to do deal with a growing group of Puritans. These are, for the most part, Calvinists within the Church of England who want to see the Church of England, the Anglican Church, the Church that Henry VIII started be more Protestant. They want to see the cathedrals stripped of their stained glass, of their saints. They want the focus to be on scripture. Uh, they want to see a lessening of the clergy, uh, no more bishops like uh, what we see in the Catholic faith. This is something that James has to deal with. He also has to deal with the fact that there are so many versions of the uh, Bible out there. Protestants are printing them. They're interpreting them for themselves. And so King James um, gets uh, leader, leading theologians of the Church of England together uh, to finally put into print a finalized, agreed upon uh, Holy Bible. And this, of course, is the King James Version of the Bible. This is the Bible that you will find in most uh, people's homes to this day, at least in the Protestant world. Um, uh, King James um, had a lot of uh, input on this. He was a very intelligent man. And again, he wanted to put an end to religious arguments, especially with these Puritans and these other radical uh, Protestant groups that are emerging, not just in England, but in France, in the uh, German states. He is trying to unify his kingdom um, under one faith, um, no different than uh, the, the, the Roman emperors um, back with the Council of Nicaea. It was James, it was James that finally successfully placed English colonies in the land of Virginia, named after his cousin Elizabeth. Uh, the first successful uh, uh, English colony in North America was, of course, Jamestown, named in honor of uh, uh, King James. Uh, we won't go into detail with these early colonies. That is for another class. But just know but that by the middle 1600s, the English have um, a presence in modern day Virginia, Maryland, and of course, New England. Everything green here is English or British. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But don't forget, in those early decades, uh, the English had to compete with the Dutch and the Swedes um, in this region. Uh, but in the end, of course, you know that the English will win out and found uh, 13 colonies along the eastern seaboard. But again, that is for another class. In the early 1600s, King James had to deal with a massive plot now known in history as the gunpowder gun powder plot. Uh, pardon me. Um, this involved a number of Catholic conspirators. The plan was simple. The plan was simple. What we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's still a sizable number of Catholics in um, uh, uh, England. And even though Elizabeth 
was somewhat tolerant for its time, for her time. And James is somewhat tolerant for his time. It's still technically to, uh, illegal to be openly uh, a Catholic uh, in many ways. Uh, you're a second class citizen in England as a Catholic and Catholics believe that England has gone awry. We need to return them to the one true faith, the Roman Catholic faith. And so these Catholic conspirators enter into a dastardly plot. The plot involves the House of Lords, Parliament. And what they're going to do is they're going to take out the king and parliament all in one foul swoop. Now, this is a modern image of the modern House of Lords. This was built much later, but it's just to give you an idea, just an idea. King James is set to open parliament. Um, it's still the uh, job of the uh, uh, British monarch to open up a session of uh, parliament, a season of parliament. Anyways, what these Catholic conspirators were going to do is underneath the House of Parliament. Now, this is an, uh, this is this building was not around back then. This is the modern House of Parliament. That isn't until the 1800s that this thing is built. But just again, to build you a picture, what we're going to do is we're going to blow up the House of Lords. Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the gunpowder the gunpowder plot <laughs> involved um, going underneath the House of Lords and placing hundreds of barrels of gunpowder underneath the House of Lords. And as the king is in there with all of the most powerful men of the realm, we're going to blow it up. We're going to blow it up with King James dead. We will place his child uh, on the throne his daughter on the throne, um, whether she's Catholic or not, is important because we'll make her a Catholic. And England and even Scotland will be restored to the one true faith, the Roman Catholic faith. Well, the conspirators were caught, including one of the leaders, Guy Fox. Guy Fox was caught. The conspirators were rounded up, tortured, mutilated, and killed. Um, this was uh, uh, very narrowly very narrowly uh, 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 prevented for the record, the infamous gunpowder powder plot. I don't know why I can't say that word. Gunpowder plot, gunpowder plot, gunpowder plot. Guy Fawkes and other leaders were burned. They were burned. And every year after that, in November, English children would celebrate by building their own guy. Yes, this is a dummy. This is a dummy. Uh, made an appearance of Guy, and you would parade them around town. You would parade them around town, this little dummy dressed as Guy. And depending on how well, how good of a job you did, people would give you money. Um, it was a common phrase, penny for the guy, penny for the guy. Uh, and this goes back, this goes back centuries. Um, I went to high school uh, for a time in London, and it was still being practiced when I was there penny for the guy and this is a celebration this is it's it's guy fox day um late uh, uh november i believe or no is it early november i don't even remember shame on me shame on me i lose all points <laughs> it's around halloween i think it's early november to be honest with you i think it's early november i could be wrong you can look it up but i love these old images uh penny for the guy It's, it's very funny. It's very politically incorrect when you think about it. Um, uh, I'm sure it's not done nearly as often as it was uh, when I was there in the 1990s. Penny for the guy. When you think about it, let's have a bunch of kids dress up like, I mean, uh, make a dummy, dress them up as a Catholic terrorist, and then burn them at the stake. Because that's what you do. On the night of it, you burn the guy. You burn the guy. Some of these parties are giant. Um, some of these bonfires are humongous. Um, and you let off fireworks and you drink. Um, it's the equivalent. I guess it's the English 4th of July in many ways. There is no Independence Day in England. Um, a, a date was never issued for that one. But uh, here you go. Guy Fox Day. And I have read that it's been lessening. Uh, people are, are squeamish. And in the the era of political correctness, I don't know how much longer Guy Fawkes Day can last. What was the role of Parliament up to the early 1600s? James comes from Scotland, where Parliament was fairly weak, um, but he comes to England. 
to rule over England as well. And he is very, very frustrated with the power of parliament in England. Up until Elizabeth, up until Elizabeth, Parliament was fairly weak. It was simply an advisory board of, of, of nobles in England, lords, that would advise the crown on certain things. However, 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 um, and these were supposed to be temporary in times of, 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 of crisis or need, Elizabeth allowed for a tremendous amount of power within in Parliament, all in the name of peace. She allowed Parliament to have a lot of power. And for the record, Elizabeth was very uh, thrifty with her money. Um, and so she never needed that much money. Uh, her father, Henry VIII, had spent like a madman. And uh, Elizabeth was a notorious penny pincher. And so when she ruled England in the 1500s, she and Parliament got on fairly well. She even, she even allowed for the increase in, 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 in power when it came to Parliament. Parliament also made up in the House of Lords, um, allowed propertied men, wealthy men only, just wealthy propertied men to elect representatives uh, to represent um, the everyman. This is the House of Commons. This is the lower house. So you have the House of Lords, right, made up of, of bona fide lords. These are members of the noble class, the knightly class. And then wealthy men were allowed to elect other wealthy men to be in the House of Commons. Now, you, it's called the House of Commons. You think, oh, it's just common people. No, 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 no. No, normal poor people won't be allowed to vote in England until uh, the 1800s. So forget about that. It became, it became widely accepted by Parliament that its role by the early 1600s was to uh, 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 handle taxes. Now, the king or queen could rule as a king or queen, but when it came to collecting taxes, that was the role of Parliament. And Parliament had to agree upon uh, uh, why you were raising taxes. A king can't go out and uh, uh, collect the taxes, right? The nobles of each region of England collected taxes and, and, and moved them on to the monarch. That was the role of Parliament. This was a sort of agreed upon uh, 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 constitution. The king rules, certainly. He is the head of state. However, if the king needs to raise money for a war, for any sort of large building project, it's up to Parliament, made up of lords and commoners, to agree upon it. This is the role of Parliament. This is the Parliament that James inherits from his cousin, Elizabeth I. He does not like this. He doesn't think that a king should have to rule alongside Parliament. James I was a firm believer in a concept, a very popular concept by the 1600s, and this is known as the divine right of kings, the divine right of kings. Increasingly, increasingly, kings in Europe are asserting that they rule divinely, meaning they are granted their power from God. And they rule as, in many ways, a mini-god on earth. To strike a king is to strike against God. He is here uh, because of God. Let me give you a quote. Let me give you a quote by James I uh, when it comes to his belief in divine right of kings. This is James I on this divine right of kings. Quote, the state of monarchy is the supremest thing upon earth. For kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth and sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself are called gods. Believers in the divine right of kings point to the Bible. The Bible. Yes, indeed, the Bible. Let me go back here. Pardon me. Did the kings of the Old Testament not rule supported by God? Did they rule with parliaments? No. Did King David rule with a parliament? Did King Solomon rule with a parliament? So kings, too, are reading their Bible, and they are drawing inspiration. They're also looking to history uh, with the way that the Roman emperors ruled. 
Did the emperors of Rome rule with a Senate? We know they didn't. They might have had the Senate, but they ruled absolutely. Increasingly, kings in France, especially Spain as well, are ruling absolutely. And King James I believes that kings are many gods on earth and rule absolutely. They don't need parliament for anything. And he resents the fact that parliament um, sits on the uh, uh, gold coins that he wants so much of. He will pass this belief on, this divine right of kings, to his son, Charles. Charles will inherit this belief that kings rule ordained by God and should rule absolutely without any interference from anyone, whether it be parliament, whether it be a bishop, whether it be another king, divine right of kings. And James passes this firm belief on to his son with giant consequences, with giant consequences. Charles the first, Charles the first. In 1625, in 1625, Charles the first was crowned king of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And just like his father, he was a steadfast believer in the divine right of kings. Almost immediately, almost immediately, Charles begins to ruffle feathers as king. He will do a number of things and enact a number of policies that scare the living hell out of many Englishmen, especially Puritans, those radical Protestants. What were the policies of Charles and why does he scare the living hell out of so many influential Englishmen? Well, off the top, he marries Henrietta Maria. Henrietta Maria was a Catholic princess. She was a Catholic princess. The Catholics are the enemy. The Catholics are the enemy, and our king has married a Catholic. That means that his children could very well be Catholic. The next king of England will be raised by a French Catholic and they themselves could be Catholic. On top of this, to make things even uh, more terrifying, Charles begins to advocate or argue for religious toleration for Catholics. What? Religious toleration for Catholics? My God, Charles. My God. On top of that, Charles I loved, loved all of the ceremony and the pageantry, and the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't hide this. And he wanted to secure, if not increase, the Church of England's majesty, ceremony, pomp, circumstance. He was a great defender of everything that the Puritans hated about the Church of England, the fact that they have bishops, the candles, the stained glass. He was a defender of this. And remember, remember, to this day, the head of the Church of England is also the king. And so when you criticize, when you criticize the Church of England, you are criticizing Charles I. To this day, Queen Elizabeth is the leader of the Church of England. And so uh, 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 and, and the person who replaces her will be the uh, 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 head of the Church of England. And so to criticize the Church of England is treason, according to Charles. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the highest bishop in the land, William Laud, um, begins to persecute Puritans. He begins to persecute Puritans. Puritans are speaking out against the Church of England. They're speaking out against the uh, uh, king himself. This is why so many Puritans end up in the New World. They are being arrested. They are being beaten. They are even being killed by English mobs, um, encouraged by the English authorities. To be a Puritan isn't quite treason, but it can get you there very, very quickly. 
Charles also wants to enter the Thirty Years' War. This is what gets him into trouble. By the middle 1600s, the Thirty Years' War is raging in Europe. And Charles, being young, seeking glory, wants to enter the Thirty Years' War against Spain, especially, especially against Spain. He puts in charge of the English attempt to enter the Thirty Years' War, his trusted friend, George Villiers. George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham, uh, was a very, very, very close friend of uh, Charles and most likely his homosexual lover. Villiers was hated by many of the nobles of England. Many believed that the only reason he was made the Duke of Buckingham and was put in charge of these English forces um, who are going to invade France um, is because of his very close relationship with Charles. Charles goes to Parliament and he asks for a blank check. He asks for a blank check so that Villiers can enter the Thirty Years' War against Spain. Parliament does not grant this blank check. Parliament does put aside some money, but uh, does not issue a blank check for this proposed war. This greatly angers Charles. This greatly angers Charles, um, who allows Villiers to attack the Spanish. Now, this venture, this failed invasion, this failed invasion of Rochelle, France, um, will humiliate Villiers and humiliate Charles. Uh, suddenly, 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 um, Parliament begins to rally against this expedition. Rather than listen to criticisms from Parliament, Charles simply dissolves Parliament. He sends them home, and he can do that. He says, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and listen to this. They were about to impeach Villiers. They were uh, to force him to come home uh, to face uh, a questioning by Parliament. He dissolves Parliament. With Parliament, with Parliament gone, Charles needs money. He can't ask Parliament. Parliament's not going to give him any money for this war. And so he begins to force he begins to force members of parliament to loan him money. Um, this is not a loan. He's not going to pay them back. Um, he collects hundreds of thousands of, of, of pounds from uh, the wealthy nobles of England through forced loans. Um, again, this isn't a loan. He's extorting money from the wealthy nobles of England. Uh, forced loans uh, is just another word for taxes. Then he's not going to pay him back. Suddenly, for the first time, uh, this is interesting to uh, American audiences, we begin to hear no taxation without representation. No taxation without parliamentary representation. Just know that the founding fathers will study this period. The American founding fathers will study this period very very, very, very closely. Charles needs money. These forced loans are not enough. And so he calls Parliament back. He calls Parliament back. Parliament agrees to give him money. He agree, they agree to give him money, but he has to agree to something. Charles has to agree to something. He has to agree to the petition of right. Parliament will give him money, not a blank check, but money, if he agrees to this very important law, the Petition of Right. What the Petition of Right does is it lays out specific English liberties. Members of Parliament were amateur historians, and they delve deep back into the history of England, they study the Magna Carta, uh, among other things, and they come to believe, based on the Magna Carta, uh, that the king is not above the law. The king has to act within the law. And this just lays out certain restrictions, certain rights that the people of England have over their king, such as it is parliament who taxes, period. 
Number one, it is parliament that taxes. Number two, it places restrictions on the quartering of soldiers. This has increased in the last few years. Uh, you cannot simply tell a town or an individual that you have to support these soldiers for an extended period of time. You can't simply quarter your soldiers anywhere you want. Number three, no imprisonment without cause. At this time, the king is imprisoning nobles who refuse to pay these forced loans. You cannot imprison someone without cause. You simply can't lock someone up and forget about them. No, no, no. You need to show evidence. You need to show cause. And finally, it places restrictions on martial law. Martial law is military law. You cannot simply have the military take over a town or a region and force the people uh, to uh, act accordingly. Things like curfews and searches of your person and body, things like that. It's the petition of right. Charles is in a very tough situation, so he agrees. He agrees to the petition of right, and the parliament gives him his money for his uh, war ventures. However, tensions continue to increase between Charles and Parliament. By the way, Parliament is increasingly, increasingly under the power and influence of Puritans, just so you know. A large number of the middle and merchant class are Puritans. Puritanism is especially popular in cities. Um, among the literate, educated classes. Things come to a head when the first Duke of Buckingham is killed at a pub in Portsmouth. He was getting ready to organize another expedition against the Spanish, and he is murdered. He is murdered. Now, the man who killed... Uh, 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 Villiers, John Felton, uh, this was most likely over something separate, a promotion. Um, here you can see the knife that uh, <laughs> Felton killed the Duke of Buckham. Oh, by the way, the uh, pub recently went up for sale. Um, it has since been turned into a home. You can buy the Greyhound pub. I think it's a 1.5 million pounds. Anyways, the people of England, or at least many leading nobles, celebrated the death of Villiers. They hated this man. They hated this man. But what it does, what it does is it hardens the heart of Charles. It makes him even less likely to negotiate. His friend has been killed. Possibly his lover has been killed. Many of the nobles um, who he has to deal with in Parliament have supported this or did support this, or at least celebrated it, um, the heart of Charles hardens. And this is when things uh, uh, go from bad to worse. For 11 years, for 11 years, Charles rules without parliament. This is known later um, as the 11 years tyranny, the 11 years tyranny. He is completely allowed to do this. Under the law, Parliament does not have to be called regularly. Um, he is completely allowed to do this. Um, however, in doing this, there is a rising discontent from the nobility of England. They do not appreciate the fact that he is ruling without Parliament. For the most part, the common people, the everyday English people, and to a lesser degree, the everyday Scottish people um, support Charles during this time. He's actually very, very popular. However, however, as long as England isn't in war, Charles can rule without parliament. He doesn't need that money. There's other ways of raising money that will keep him going fine. And then this happens. Revolt in Scotland, known as the Bishop's War. Long story short, this will bring an end to Charles's one-man rule in Britain. What happens is Charles and his Archbishop Laud try to impose Church of England Book of Common Prayer on the uh, uh, Scottish people. The Scottish are Calvinists. They don't want to be a part of the Church of England. This kicks off 
a war in Scotland. And the Scottish actually cross the border into northern England and begin to pillage North English towns and cities. Charles needs to kick out the Scottish from England. His own people, remember, he's the king of Scotland and England, but nonetheless, the Scottish are being rebellious. And so he calls Parliament back. He recalls Parliament. He needs money. He needs money. However, 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 when the members of Parliament arrive, rather than discuss the bishops' war, they want to hammer out more grievances that they have with Charles. They don't simply want to raise money and give him a blank check to fight the Scottish. In fact, many of them openly speak out against invading Scotland or even fighting the, uh, 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 the Scottish there. And so uh, 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 as they continue to argue, um, Charles loses his patience and dissolves parliament again. This is known as the short parliament because it wasn't in session that long. He brings them together. He asks for money. They said, hey, wait a minute. We have more things to discuss. He says, you know what? Never mind. Go away. And so this is known as the short parliament because it was not in session very long. However, however, he is forced to call parliament back. He is forced to call parliament back because the Scottish are making war in the north and he needs money. This time, Parliament is able to issue a number of grievances. A number of grievances. In fact, this time, Parliament's even madder at him for sending them home before. The long Parliament, as it is known, because they're not going home, they were in session for a very long time, issue a number of demands and reforms. They issue a number of demands and reforms reforms. Number one, they demand less toleration for Catholics. Number one, less toleration for Catholics. All of these tolerant uh, moves that you've made, rescind them, rescind them. Number two, they demand that a new parliament should meet at least once every three years. Even if the king doesn't call parliament, at least once every three years, Parliament should meet. Number three, it is illegal for the king to impose taxes without Parliament's consent. We thought we had discussed this before, but we wanted to make it absolutely clear. It gave more control by Parliament over the king's ministers. And then finally, finally, Parliament passed a law forbidding the king to dissolve it without its consent. Even after the three years were up, you cannot dissolve it without Parliament's consent. Ever since then, it has been known as the Long Parliament. Now, to make the king feel better, they also argued that every uh, uh, adult in uh, the realm should sign an oath of allegiance to Charles. But these were the demands and the reforms. The effects. Well, Charles is not going to negotiate with Parliament. Charles is not going to negotiate with long parliament. He is not going to give in to these demands. He is not going to give in to these reforms. In fact, in 1642, January, he enters parliament with 400 troops and he demands that parliament hand over a number of leaders of these reforms and demands. However, parliament tells him no, no, no. In fact, they weren't there, but they tell Charles, we, as members of parliament, answer to parliament, not you, your highness. And so Charles is forced to leave parliament. He is forced to leave parliament. In fact, in fact, he moves to the north and raises an army. We are entering a very cataclysmic time in English history. We are entering the English Civil War, also known as the War of the Three Kingdoms. Parliament versus Charles. Parliamentarians versus monarchists. Who is going to have real power in Britain? Is it going to be Parliament or is it going to be the monarch? Who has supreme say in matters of the state? This will lead to all out civil war, the English civil war, but it's going to involve Scotland and it's going to involve Ireland as well. 
Just so you know, our founding fathers were very familiar with the events leading up to, during, and after the English Civil War. They will draw inspiration from the English Civil War. When they feel that they are not being listened to, that their rights are not being met, it will be as Englishmen that they rebel. Their rights as Englishmen are not being met. The so-called American Revolution really is just a second English Civil War. Please know that. Please know that. When John Adams and Jefferson both visit England after the American Revolution, they will both ask to visit the sites of the English Civil War. And uh, Adams was asked, why? Why do you want to see the sites of the English Civil War? You know, it's 100 years ago. John Adams will say, well, this is where our fight began. And he meant the American War of Independence. This is the birth of the American Revolution, and that is the English Civil War. English Civil War, 1642 to 1651. This was a series of conflicts. This was a series of conflicts between parliamentarians, the people who believe that parliament should have final say in matters, and monarchists, supporters of the king, who believed that kings should have final say in matters. Um, it is also a religious war, not like so much in Europe. It's not between uh, a Calvinists and, and Catholics, but the Puritans will lead the parliamentarians. Other radical Protestants will join with the Puritans. Um, and around the king will be uh, members of traditional Church of England supporters and Catholics. Remember, under Charles, they were granted religious toleration. And so this is also a religious civil war in many ways, too. And this will also affect the colonies, just so you know. One out of six Puritan men in New England will come back and fight in this war. Uh, New England will be parliamentarian because they're Puritan, whereas uh, uh, Maryland and um, Virginia will overwhelmingly be a, 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 a royalist or monarchist supporting the king because these were members of the Church of England. Charles will lead his troops, maybe not so much in the front row, but he will fight in this war. Uh, he'll do quite well. He will do quite well. Uh, fighting for the king will be his cousin, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Uh, he gets a very, very bad reputation. Um, he had been fighting in wars since a child. Um, he will take the wars of religion and the ways of fighting in Europe to the English. Um, he's a German prince, but he's fighting on behalf of the king. Um, he will uh, be very much feared by the parliamentarians, including his dog, who they said had eyes of fire um, uh, and was half devil. Um, this is his dog. Uh, 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 uh. Students sometimes laugh when they find out what kind of dog this greatly feared dog was. It was a poodle. It was a poodle. But poodles are hunting dogs. Poodles uh, can be quite big and quite fearsome, just so you know. What we've done to poodles since the 1600s is, is, is a crime. Um, but uh, uh, dogs actually play a very important role in this. This is a propaganda war, just so you know. I'm having a joke here. But uh, uh, both sides will implement propaganda. By middle 1600s, uh, Britain, uh, many people are literate. They can read. And so it's not just a, a, a war of ideas. It's a war of propaganda. I mean, it's not just a physical war. It's a war of ideas and propaganda. Pardon me. Uh, this dog has got it. These two guys are, are uh, 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 headed off to each other. We've got a poodle. Biden pepper. <laughs> Absolutely terrible absolutely terrible both sides both sides commit what would now would be uh called um uh, uh war crimes absolutely terrible um many many soldiers will die but many many more uh civilians will die and that's the nature of war unfortunately including women and children during this conflict a member of parliament a puritan by the name of oliver cromwell will come to become the de facto leader of the parliamentarians, Oliver Cromwell. He is a very, very adept general, um, very inspiring to his troops. He is not a wealthy noble. Um, Oliver Cromwell emerges as an uh, uh, unofficial leader of the parliamentarians. He comes from the lower gentry. 
he comes from the lower gentry. Um, not, not one of these great houses. Cromwell believes that this is not just a fight between Parliament and the monarchists, but this is a battle between good and evil, that God, God is at play here. He forms what has come to be called the New Model Army, the New Model Army. And in many ways, this becomes a very modern army, hence the name, the New Model Army. He introduces uh, drilling constant drilling and we know from our lessons how important discipline and practice and drilling is to training an army this is something ridiculous in the new model army you were promoted on merit meaning how well you did not who your father was not what kind of bloodline you have but on how good you are the new model army um, is not simply an army of the parliamentarians, though. It's an army of God. You are expected to remain godly. You're expected to read your Protestant Bible. And the New Model Army does very, very well against the monarchists, against the royalists. And those are interchangeable, those two terms. In the end, Bishop Laud, William Laud, was captured. He was put on trial, found guilty of treason. And in London, he was executed. The Puritans get their revenge when they execute Bishop Laud. In the end, in the end, Charles is eventually captured by the Scottish and handed over to the English for a price. Cromwell and the parliamentarians try to negotiate with Charles. They try to force him into agreeing to all of their demands. However, Charles knows they're not going to kill him. You can't kill a king. To commit regicide is a crime against God, and that's what a killing a king, a king is, regicide. Rather than negotiate in good faith, he escapes. He raises another army. He laughs about how he was negotiating in bad faith with Cromwell and Parliament. He tells other royalist fighters who had been captured and promised never to fight against the parliamentarians again, break your promise. Break your promise. These men are criminals. I'm a king. These are parliamentarians. Once Charles negotiates in bad faith, leaves, he goes back up north, raises another army, it is now where many parliamentarians begin to argue, including Cromwell, that King Charles has blood on his hands. Now, anyone who dies, it's Charles's fault. We could have come to a peace here. We could have negotiated something. We could have figured out a way for parliament and king to rule together, but he negotiated in bad blood. Any more deaths, and there's going to be hundreds of thousands of them. That's Charles's fault. That is Charles's fault. He has blood on his hands. In the end, the Scottish capture Charles once again and hand him over to Parliament. And he's put on trial for treason. He is put on trial for treason. Please know, please know that by this time, Cromwell has gotten rid of anyone in Parliament who isn't on his side. And so we know what it's going to be. We know the answer. We know the answer. Charles is found guilty of treason. Now, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, all of Europe is going to be asking that question. And shock of horrors, like any traitor, Charles is sentenced to die. Charles is sentenced to die. January 30th, 1649, King Charles meets his punishment. Now, it's a cold day in London. It's a blistery cold day. And so Charles makes sure that he wears two undershirts underneath his clothes because he doesn't want to be seen to be shivering because at this time, how you die determines on what kind of man you are. 
If you go to the gallows or the hang or 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 or, or, or the axe man shaking, uh, you're seen as guilty. Why why would you be scared to meet your god? You're shaking. What's the matter with you? And so he puts on two undercoats. Everyone who was there says he died a very good death. He was straight faced. He makes a short speech and he wins a date with the axe man. People who were present said as soon as that axe came down, the air was removed from the atmosphere. How many of us have done something? We've gone so many steps to do something. And the minute it's done, we're like, oh, dang, that just happened. This is the way much of England felt when they finally killed the king. Up until this point, it was all theoretical. Now we've just killed God's, represent to, to, to God's representative on earth. Um, there was an audible gasp in the crowd. We've just killed our king. Now what? Now what? What do we do now? Well, 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 Catholics, Catholics in Europe and in Britain said, I told you, I told you, I told you the minute you allowed men to read and interpret the Bible for themselves. Well, now you've opened up Pandora's box. Now they can interpret laws for themselves. Now they can interpret, can we kill a king for themselves? Once you open that up, you see the dangers of Pandora's box? Once one thing's open for interpretation, everything is open to interpretation, and you just killed the king. Good luck, guys. Good luck. Well, Oliver Cromwell doesn't become king. No, no. He's not going to become king. No. We are going to have a republic. England begins its experiment with republicanism. Parliament is going to rule Britain. However, Cromwell is the Lord Protector. He is the leader of Parliament. And in reality, in reality, Cromwell is more powerful than any king before him. Because kings had to rule by precedence, by tradition. Well, we've never had a Lord Protector before. He's really a dictator, and you'll see in history books, it's called the, the, the Cromwellian Dictatorship or the Cromwellian Protectorate. He rules pretty much absolutely because Parliament doesn't dare uh, uh, disagree with Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell goes about ruling England as a Roman emperor. It's a republic. Yeah, why not? Just like Rome was ruled by the Senate. We have coins issued. Britain is no longer a monarchy. It's a republic under Cromwell. And he goes about reforming. He goes about reforming. Remember, he's a Protestant. And many of his reforms want to show the world how a godly nation can exist. This Puritan vision of what England could be, a new Jerusalem. We've seen this tried before. We've seen this tried before. One of the first things that Cromwell does is he bans celebrations of Christmas. By the 1600s, there were open celebrations of Christmas. Show me in the Bible where you are supposed to celebrate Christmas. You could be fined. You could even be beaten for celebrating Christmas. In fact, there's stories of new model army soldiers smelling the roasting of a goose and trying to find out who in town was roasting it. Are you celebrating Christmas in there, mate? Come on out. This is seen as blasphemous. It's pagan. Look, satanical practices are forbidden. He bans the celebrating of Christmas. Remember, we are going to create a Puritan Jerusalem. What else do we ban in Cromwell's Britain? Football or soccer. Uh, these games are uh, usually uh, uh, violent. Um, people drink. Uh, it's done usually on a Sunday when you should be celebrating the Lord. Uh, by the way, Sunday is made observant. Women could be fined for doing certain chores on Sunday. Men could be fined for working on Sunday. Uh, certainly, certainly, certainly no English football on a Sunday or ever. We're banning that. Uh, we're banning public uh, uh, Shakespearean plays. 
we have to be focused on the Lord. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Uh, makeup is banned. New model army soldiers uh, routinely fined women if they had uh, painted faces or were dressed too suggestively. Um, it's the English Taliban. It's the Puritan Taliban. Um, Cromwell does, for the record, see how Jews had been helping Holland. Holland had accepted large numbers of Jews from uh, Spain and Portugal, and it is Cromwell who allows Jews to return to England. Um, he was uh, a religiously tolerant of, of Jews, not Catholics, uh, but Jews. And so Jews for the first time can come back to England and openly practice under Cromwell. The Irish campaign. This is where Cromwell gets a very bad reputation. The Irish campaign. England had been trying to, uh, through various successes and defeats, to conquer all of Ireland for centuries. In 1641, Irish Catholics rise up and they slaughter thousands of English settlers. In 1649, Irish Confederates, they form an Irish Confederacy, join up with royalists. They join up with royalists. Now, Cromwell sees this and he's terrified. What if these Irish armies invade England? What will I do? And so in 1649, Cromwell saw a very real threat and invades the island of Ireland. Fighting is going to be very, very, very brutal. And the tactics in which Cromwell uh, uses is going to be uh, uh, remembered for centuries to this day. The English adopted a policy of crop burning in fighting the Irish. They will burn your farms, they will burn your crops, and this created uh, starvation. Um, anywhere between 600,000 and 1.4 million Irish died during this uh, conflict. Uh, between 25 and 75 percent of the Irish were killed during the campaign under Cromwell. Um, it was absolutely brutal, absolutely brutal. Cromwell hated Catholics. He especially hated the Irish Catholics. And so no mercy was given to the Irish during this campaign. And we get terrible, bloody accounts of babies being put on pitchforks, uh, women being raped, men being burned. Um, absolutely brutal. Brutal was uh, Cromwell's uh, suppression of the Irish rebellion in the middle 1600s. Irish Catholic power was mostly in the South and the West, uh, but you can see before and after. Uh, 1641, um, there was quite a lot of Irish Catholic land ownership. Uh, by 1703, by 1703, um, it has been decimated. It has been decimated. Um, under Cromwell, Catholic land ownership in Ireland dropped from about 60% to uh, a total of 8%. Um, the Irish are not going to do well out of this. And more settlers, more English settlers will arrive in, um, in the island of Ireland. Casualties. For the entire English Civil War, and these are rough, rough, rough estimates, um, fighting, disease, starvation. Now, war dead, 85,000. War dead, soldiers. But the majority of the dead, like any of these terrible, especially civil wars, are always the most complicated. Um, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Uh, approximately, approximately, um, forty-one percent of the population of Ireland gone. Three to seven, a uh, three point seven percent of the population of England gone six percent of the population of scotland gone and again these numbers are all over the place because we don't have hard figures but hundreds of thousands of people are killed during this english civil war the legacy of cromwell well cromwell uh well our second president john adams viewed him as a hero the first Republican leader of England. Um, and for many, 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 many uh, decades and centuries in many parts of England, he was celebrated as a hero. Um, in Ireland, in Protestant parts of Ireland, he is still celebrated as a hero. Now, these are Protestant sections of Ireland. Um, a statue of him was erected in front of the House of Parliament in London in the 1800s. 
However, in the last century, uh, with with new histories written and a new approach, um, new sensibilities, uh, Cromwell's legacy has taken giant hits. Um, there are active active uh, 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 campaigns to have his statues removed in various parts of, of England and former Commonwealth nations. Um, and again, that's happening to a lot of, uh, of of, of figures in history, both in Europe and the United States. Um, it's years ago, years, this is a true story. Years ago, I got a dog from the pound and I was uh, uh, doing some research into uh, 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 Oliver Cromwell and um, I called him Ollie, I called the dog Ollie, right? And I had this Irish friend and I just got the dog and my friend said, um, oh, you got a dog? I said, yeah, what's your dog's name? And I wasn't even thinking. And I said, uh, Oliver. And he goes, well, that's a weird name. You know, what'd you call him Oliver for? And I said, oh, Oliver Cromwell. And he looks at me, he turns white. Remember, he's Irish. I, I wasn't thinking, I was insensitive. He goes, Oliver Cromwell, was Hitler taken? I said, what? He goes, was the name Hitler taken? So you went with Oliver Cromwell? I said, well, I don't know. I didn't ask if Hitler was taken. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that shows you, that shows you how... To me, just liking the name Oliver, thinking Cromwell, I, I don't know. But to an Irishman, that's still fresh, right? And it was centuries ago, but that's the way history works. Uh, uh, and that's the way it, it's perspective. It's perspective and experience. We are going to go back to Britain in our next uh, lesson. Um, and uh, we will look at not only Britain, um, but giant moves, giant moves giant revolutions that will change the entire world. Uh, we will get to that in our next lesson. Thank you so, so, so much. Uh, please take care.